Welcome very much. Um, my name is Dr. Joanne Selway. I am the Phase 1 Lead and Selection Lead for the University of Buckingham Medical School. Um, and I am here to talk to you about preparing for medicine selection events. So the webinar today is designed to give you some tips and guidance about how to prepare for both our MMA and our MMI events which happen within our selection process. Hopefully, given my national role looking um, across selection events in across the country, if you have got MMI interviews at any other medical school, this might be of help for that too. So, um, okay. So, I think importantly, one of the things to think about when you've got an MMI, which is a multiple mini interview, or in our case at the University of Buckingham, an MMA, a multiple mini assessment, is why are we as a university, as a medical school, putting you through these tests? And it isn't just a arbitrary cutoff um, to allow us to pick what we think are the best attributes uh, candidates. It's actually to evaluate the attributes that you have. So importantly, being a doctor, uh, being um, a professional in a healthcare setting, there are some things you need over and above the academic qualifications to prosper on the course. And those are related to the attributes of, like um, empathy and respect, but also things like values, um, things that you value about yourself, um, the value you put in your actions and the actions of those around you, and your motivation for being a doctor or being part of a healthcare profession. So these MMIs are not simply a test to rank you. They are also an ability for medical schools to look at you as a holistic person over and above your academic qualifications. Importantly, traditional interviews often have a lot of available preparation. You can think about, in a traditional interview, the sorts of questions that you might be asked and have prepared answers for those questions. And the purpose of an MMI, as opposed to a traditional interview, is to stop people having prepared answers for those questions. I agree. That is a little ironic, given that I'm giving a webinar right now around preparing for the selection process. And importantly, there are things that you can do to prepare, but it's not about being prepared to answer specific questions. Because not having answers to specific questions levels the playing field for all candidates. And across the sector, that's so important because some people will have um, support networks, they'll have family that are involved in healthcare, or even selection processes across medical schools. They may have brothers or sisters or family members that have already been through the process and can provide insight. Whereas what we're looking for is a level playing field for all candidates because you can't prepare for specific events. So MMIs are a way of medical schools choosing applicants, but it is based on your attributes, values, and motivations that you cannot prepare answers for. And it allows medical schools to pick the best candidates on those factors. So hopefully this whistle-stop tour through preparing for MMIs and MMAs will give you some insights in the sort of things that you can do to prepare for these events. So the University of Buckingham's admissions process is summarized on this screen here. Those of you that have got an invite to an MMA or an MMI um, have already passed the academic screening process in our admissions. And this is where we look at your academic qualifications and judge whether you met the necessary thresholds to prosper on our course. And you may have predicted to meet those or you may have actual grades already. But once you've met those thresholds, we can then look at the next stage, which is the MMA, the Multiple Mini Assessment. And this is our first stage of our selection in which we look at um, your individual responses to a test. The MMA is a forms-based assessment looking at values, attributes, and motivations that are all mapped to good medical practice. And I'm going to go over that a little bit more detail, but essentially you're typing your responses to a series of scenarios or tasks, um, and they're looking at um, different aspects of good medical practice. That's a really great place to start for preparation. The 
outcome of that stage could be that we um, either give you an outright offer if you're an exceptional candidate, or we could ask you to come for more um, testing, which is where the MMI, the multiple mini interview happens. And this is where you have a conversation with an assessor. And this MMI is the typical structure of interviews across the medical school in the UK. From all of these stages, it is possible that we reject you from the application process because you haven't met our demanding thresholds. But if you are successful in an MMA, MMA or an MMI and you get an offer, these are a combination of, of different things that we look at in terms of performance in the um, forms or the individual assessment as well as your academic qualifications. So it's a real um, complex in times process, but hopefully this picture provides you an overview of each stage and what can happen at each stage. So MMAs are probably unique to Buckingham. Um, the forms-based assessment isn't something that all medical schools do. And so I wanted to just take a little bit of time to explain what it is. So in essence, you have a series of tasks to complete online. And you do this in our formats in a room, um, on a live screen, um, in a virtual space with lots of other people. You do have to either type answers or select answers in whatever task and scenario you're presented with. And you'll receive a score for that task. And the cumulative score across five tasks will allow you to be ranked. Those with the highest scores will receive an offer. Or, as I just explained, another output might be that we can offer additional assessment in the terms of an MMI. But importantly, this is not a conversational assessment. This is a typed or um, selected response assessment. So the preparation for the MMAs is slightly different than the MMIs. The MMIs then are essentially a similar series of tasks and these are set up as stations where individual candidates rotate around these tasks. Many medical schools have reinstalled face-to-face um, -face MMIs where you're invited to a campus location and you complete a test. That's not what we're doing at the University of Buckingham. We're keeping a digital MMI. So you'll rotate around the tasks in a virtual manner. And the process by which you do that will be explained to you on the day but involves MS Teams access. Again, you get a score for each one of the tasks that you rotate around and complete, and the cumulative score allows you to be ranked, and those with the highest scores receive an offer. There isn't at this point any additional assessment, but there may be a waiting list in which if spaces become available, we will contact you. And it's important to consider the cumulative nature of scores here because performing on poorly, or are you perceiving that you've performed poorly in one station, um, doesn't mean that you won't get an offer. And often that's a problem with candidates overthinking um, their performance and not realizing the confident approach that you've given to assessment. So as I've said, across the sector, digital MMIs really rose during the COVID pandemic where we were unable um, as a medical school or across different medical schools in the UK to provide an on-site experience. We feel at Buckingham that the, we have an ongoing need and desire for, from our candidates to have digital MMIs because of the international mix of our students that are um, applying to us as a medical school. So we're going to keep the digital format, but individual medical schools have their own processes and some are keeping them for international students, some are requiring um, UK uh, or British national students to have an in-person MMI. So do make sure that you understand whether um, you as an individual have an in-person or a digital interview across the various different places that you might be interviewing for. And furthermore, even if you do have a digital MMI at multiple places, there's a variety of different platforms, a variety of different formats. So it's really important that you understand the format. Ask questions um, because it's important for you as an individual to know as much as possible before. 
And that's really what I'm going to talk about in this next slide is the University of Buckingham perspective on what being prepared is about. And I personally think there are three main areas for being prepared for both MMIs and MMAs. And I'm going to talk through each one um, and hopefully answer some of your questions. However, if you do have any questions that crop up um, throughout the webinar, do make sure you pop them in the Q&A. Um, we've got a team of people behind the scenes that are ready to answer those questions, and there will be an opportunity for me to pick up on some of those at the end. So type them in as we go. We don't want to um, miss or get, let you forget any of those questions that you might have. So let's start with operational preparedness. The operational preparedness, what does that mean? It basically means ensure where you are going or that you know how to use the platform that's being used for the digital event. So for the University of Buckingham, we're, we're using a Teams-based system. Have you used Teams before? Many of you which have been in, who have been in education in recent years will have used MS Teams, Microsoft Teams. But there may be some of you that use different systems for your education, or perhaps you haven't been in that educational environment for a while. Importantly, make sure you know how to open a call, um, type in the chat, put up your hand, some of the basic functions of being in that interactive platform. Make sure, as I did for Zoom when I opened it today, that it's an up-to-date version that you're using. Another very obvious, but sometimes, um, from my experience, overlooked piece of preparation is to read all of the pre-interview information that's provided to you, and that is online. So the university admissions team will be sending you information about the MMA and MMIs um, that you are invited to. The university website will have a lot of information about the selection process, possibly some policy documents or some codes of practice, some standard documents. Make sure you read them all. Many of you that are here um, and are registered are already well ahead of the game because you're, you know that there's these instructional webinars that can help you think about some of the things that we're thinking about when we're putting together our MMIs and MMAs. So all of that pre-read information um, should be something that you're going over, making sure you thoroughly understand and asking any questions about because that's an operational piece of information that is available to you. Motivations as well is a really important thing that you as an individual um, can think about and can understand in yourself. The personal statement that you use is likely to have included some of these ideas and some of these thoughts around your motivations for why you want to be a doctor. And it's true that at most points um, across the sector, the um, personal statement is not used as a differentiator of our candidates. It's generally only read to make sure there's no information in there that is of a, a negative viewpoint. And actually, it's not used to say this is a good candidate or this is a bad candidate, because we know that people get help with their personal statement. But when you have created that, whether it was on your own or with somebody else, you're likely to have included the reasons why you want to be a doctor. Go back and revisit them. Make sure it's true. Make sure it's authentic to you. Make sure that you actually can talk about those reasons because they might be part of what you're talking about or building in to your conversations in your MMI and MMA. One thing that you might not have thought about for a while, if at all, is why you want to attend the school that's giving you an interview. So if you have got an interview, an MMA or an MMI at the University of Buckingham, why Buckingham? Why are you interested in studying at our specific school? It's true of any school across the sector. And understanding that motivation um, is really important. Why are you a good fit? Why do you believe that you would be a good student in that particular school? Um, and often that's something that people overlook when they're thinking about interview processes. They're so ecstatic to get an interview at, you know, in a very saturated market. They don't think about um, the particular school that they're interviewing at. So values and attributes is another one that I think as an individual, 
you can think about, but actually you need to think about values and attributes across a whole range of societal levels as well. Look at healthcare values. And here really I'm talking about both um, NHS values, um, I'm talking about global healthcare values, differences between those different settings. What is it about the NHS? Um, what are the values that it upholds? The hospitals that we as a medical school or whichever school you're working with, do they have any unique healthcare values that they talk about on their websites? So have a look at those, understand those and understand what they mean in the context of you studying as a medical student. And importantly, you've thought about why you might be motivated to study at a particular school, but have you looked at the medical school values themselves? And do those two things align? Do you have a similar value? Um, does a medical school, for example, uh, like the University of Buckingham have a feature of support? Um, is it the small group um, teaching environment? You know, those are values um, that we have as a medical school that we focus on um, that maybe align or don't align with your values and attributes that you have. We have a high focus on generalist education, thinking about uh, perhaps um, that generic ability to act as a foundation doctor. Perhaps you don't know what specialty you're interested in yet, and that approach is very useful for you. And finally, what values and attributes do you think make a good doctor? And that's really important because that's a, a self-thinking, a self-reflection moment. Do you have those values? It may be quite uncomfortable thinking about what you need to develop in terms to be a good doctor. But on our course, you've got four and a half years to develop those attributes. And understanding what they are from the beginning gives you a head start. And actually, we don't expect everybody to know what those values um, and know exactly what those values are, um, to know exactly how to enact all those values, because that's part of the course development. But thinking about it, having your own opinion, expressing an opinion um, is really important to us at the University of Buckingham, um, but probably elsewhere as well. So there are some generic things you can think about when preparing for MMAs and MMIs. And one of the things that you could do if you're in a group, say you're um, in secondary education, um, you're in further education, and there's a group of you thinking about applying to healthcare where MMIs and MMAs are present, is to get together in a group and design some. If you were thinking about a particular attribute, if you wanted to, to, to test motivation, how would you do that? And actually then testing each other on those station designs. And in I know in sixth form colleges, there's often a group of people applying to medical schools. And you can use each other's experiences to help design some of these stations. There are paid for um, experiences that you can have. I personally don't think they have a significant value, but a self-reflective exercise in a group can really get as much value um, as anything that you can purchase in terms of medical school access. So there are some more things that I would recommend to you. And being up to date on the latest hot topics in medicine and healthcare is important. We do want people that have an interest in these topics. So knowing about them is a really good thing. And we do have in the University of Buckingham some webinars coming up um, across the year that touch on some of the hot topics. But there are lots of other places where you can find out um, about um, hot topics in medicine. Doctor's strikes are happening, are you? Understanding the different perspectives on those strikes. Obviously, we've had uh, the coronavirus, but there are other elements going on in healthcare that are causing an acute demand on services. Do you know about those and the reasonings behind um, that service demand? One of the really important things you can do is to talk to people. So practice, practice, practice talking to people and interacting with people and understanding how people think and behave. And my best advice here would be to talk to people that are outside your usual social group. 
it's very easy to talk to somebody that you connect with socially or that is like you but actually talking transgenerational um, can be quite interesting and you can learn a lot about yourself and your style um, talking to people outside of your socioeconomic um, group um, outside of your nation nationality or race group um, outside of your gender um, it can be very interesting to talk across religions and understand different perspectives on different um, things that might go on in society but it is difficult it is uncomfortable sometimes but it is with that uncomfortable nature that we grow so talking to people that could be perhaps in a job that you might have um, that's a really great way could be in a volunteering capacity or it could literally be you know, talking to somebody in a coffee queue um, it doesn't have to be a structured event but talk 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 interact 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 you'll learn a lot about yourself and you'll hone your skills if you want something to read i would recommend um, the GMC guidance documents and particularly good medical practice, which is what here at the University of Buckingham we map our selection events to. We look at all of the guidance around good medical practice and there is a new version of good medical practice coming out um, at the end of January. Um, it's already out, sorry, but it's being implemented at the end of January in the NHS. So that document, again, is a hot topic. It's new news, things that have changed in there. Why have what updates are in there? What's the new focus in terms of practicing um, in a UK um, environment? And importantly then, something else that I think is underutilized by people looking to go into medical school is practicing the reflection that you can have on your actions, your behaviors, your skills. And reflection isn't just recalling what happened, but it's actually identifying learning points from something that you've experienced. Perhaps this webinar, for example, you're experiencing it now, you could give a summary of it, but what have you taken from it? What is your learning point? What are you going to change on the back of listening to this webinar? And I think that often that reflective nature is something that's a skill that isn't um, as strong um, in some candidates as it could be, because again, it's about practice practicing being critical of yourself and your interaction and if you can do that then you will grow and you'll develop your skill set so there are some wider recommended reading and action in the moment there is some more things that you can do and actually thinking about these in advance having that conscious thought process before you go into an MMA or an MMI is very useful and I've tried to summarize some of those things that you should be thinking about um, when you get um, into the exam. And reading the instruction. And again, I imagine if you're in health, if you're in education at the moment, um, you probably are hearing this if you're about to take exams. Um, read the instructions, think about answer length, and actually answer the question that's in front of you. <laughs> Don't answer the question that you think is being asked. Know how many questions are in a station. Reading the instructions for a station, it will tell you all the information about the operations, how many questions, how many parts of a task. If there is a task, are there questions afterwards? You know, knowing the time frame gives you an idea about the length of answer. Again, answering the question, not just reading the instructions, but answering the questions. Frame your responses around the question. Be direct. With the MMA, there is going to be a prescribed, um, structured response answer. You know, putting it, making it easy for people to mark that um, is at your advantage. Do not have pre-prepared statements ready to read because it's likely that these are not going to be a direct answer to the question and it's going to sound like you're a robot. Definitely don't want robot doctors, although it is a hot topic you should probably have a look at. Um, and so thinking about these things before you go in, making sure you don't have those pre-prepared answers is really important. And the first one, which is a slightly difficult thing to, to judge, especially when you're in an online environment, is how first impressions matter. And everybody has a different perception about um, how people should present themselves in healthcare. And there's not a right or a wrong answer. 
But it's important that you dress and you present yourself in a way that you think a doctor should. You think a healthcare professional should. You need to think about politeness and what that means potentially in a UK cultural context. You need to stick to the rules. Don't talk to each other if we ask you not to. <laughs> um, put your hand up, put your hand down when we ask you to. Follow the instructions of either an invigilator in the room or the examiner. We will be looking at that alongside looking at how you perform in the actual tasks. You know, that respect that you give to people in your own environment is really, really important. So there are some of the things that actually in the operations of the day you can think about. Okay. This is probably more appropriate when we're thinking about MMIs rather than MMAs, because the MMI is where you'll have your one-on-one -on -one conversation um, with an assessor um, to guide you through a task or listen to you performing a task. And it is difficult in a digital environment to have effective communication, because you don't have the same cues that you may have um, in a face-to-face -face environment. But you can still do things to help with eye contact and active listening. And I'm trying to do some of those things when I'm talking to you in the webinar right now. You can look directly into the camera and make sure that your camera is positioned so you're not looking up at it. Nobody wants to be looking up your nose throughout the entire um, event. By looking directly into the camera, you can perceive the audience um, maybe getting the eye to eye contact. Okay? Whereas if you're looking at the screen, if I look at my screen here, you're probably not seeing my eyes in that same way. You can get software to help you by maneuvering around if you've got little video camera feeds, um, the assessor to be closest to the camera. You can pin them. And active listening can still happen in an online environment because the head nod, the tilt, um, you know, can really show that you are listening to what somebody is saying. So do practice, practice, sorry, um, the eye contact and the active listening in this environment. This may seem strange, but body awareness is also important. You can't really see past my shoulders here, but I can assure you that I am sitting with my feet um, flat on the ground and to sit up straight. Because if I'm hunching forward or I'm slouching in the chair, those things don't give the impression that you're keen to be there or motivated or excited even um, about this opportunity. So don't forget the rest of your body language because the non-verbal cues that you give off can be very powerful. You will have also noticed that my hands they're going like this, and I'm trying really hard not to do it. But they are very distracting, I imagine, for you as audience members. And the same can be true if you're giving um, an interview and your assessor is watching you. They want to be looking at you and listening to your response, not responding to hands flying around, which can be very distracting. And they're not the only distracting thing that can happen in a digital environment um, to um, distract people from your communication and the message that you're trying to convey. Make sure that you only have the video conferencing screen open, close all the other applications, make sure that therefore you've got no notifications that are going to ping up and distract you. Make sure that if you um, aren't speaking and you're listening that you mute yourself because actually um, you may have background noise which you weren't expecting because even the best laid plan um, can be disrupted. Make sure you also clutter your frame. Hopefully, you can just see my white wall um, behind me, and therefore there isn't any distraction from a beautiful picture that I have slightly further down the wall, um, or I'm at home, so my children's um, toys in the other corner. You don't need to be um, distracting your assessor to look at anything other than you and the conversation. And if it is difficult to, to declutter, virtual backgrounds can help with this. But remember that adds to the bandwidth issue if you're in an unstable uh, Wi-Fi environment. I did write a blog about communicating at, at a distance, um, which is available on the Medic portal. It's a couple of years old now, but I had a look, and I do feel everything is still relevant if you'd like to have a look um, and explore this further. 
So the MMA really goes beyond the knowledge and the MMI goes even further beyond the knowledge of becoming a doctor. We know if you've passed your academic qualifications at a certain level, you've got the academic ability um, to prosper on our course. But being a doctor is so much more than being able to cope with the academic um, input. And this was known well over 100 years ago. And this quote is a favorite of our dean of school. Um, and if you are successful in your MMAs and MMIs, I am sure that you will see this quote again in your induction week. Because it's about you as a person. It's about you and how you interact with your patients and the things that you value and bring to the healthcare profession that will tell you whether you're going to be a good doctor or not. And therefore, that's what we're looking for in the MMAs and MMIs. And that's not something you can massively prepare for. So read the documentation guidance that I've suggested. Think about all the things that I've suggested. But actually, come to the MMAs and the MMIs ready to be yourself. Because what we want in healthcare is a representation across all aspects of society. So be you, and hopefully that will allow us to see you and get you on campus and training as a doctor next year. So we do have some webinars that are coming up that might help um, boost some of your knowledge around hot topics, um, give you some insights into some other elements of our operations here at the University of Buckingham. Um, feel free to register for those as you registered for this webinar. I'm repeating this webinar again in March. Um, so if you do want to come again, I'd love to have you here. But right now, um, I'm going to say thank you. Do join in our social media pages. You can see the variety of different social media handles on this screen. Um, there's regular updates. I often tag in some of my posts into this and you'll see what's going on um, in phase one of the school. But right now, I'm going to say thank you very much. I'm going to come off of sharing and go to the Q&A um, where I'm hope, hoping there'll be lots of questions to answer about our selection processes. So bear with me one second while I just transfer screens. Oh yeah, lots of questions. Fabulous. So if you do have any other questions that I haven't answered, please do pop them into the Q&A box. We've got a team of people typing answers in response, but I'm also going to pick up um, some of the questions um, that I've directed to um, in the conversation now. So um, from Anonymous, do tell me your name. I love to speak to you if you have a name. Um, will there be questions that are multiple choice or will all of them be timed responses? So in the MMA, there are a variety of different question types. Some of them will be multiple choice, some of them will be ranking, some of them will be selecting, and some of them will be typing. So there's a variety of different um, choices of question. So, um, I can't really be any more specific than that. But thank you for your question. So um, next question, um, should your preparation for MMA be different than your prep for the MMI? So it's difficult because everything that we're going to be asking you about in both um, MMA and MMI is about your values, your attributes, your motivation. But actually being able to talk about them is important for the MMI but being able to write about them in a concise way is important for the MMA. So there is a different approach, I think. But I think it's about understanding yourself um, and being able to apply that knowledge about yourself to a specific scenario. So um, I think they are overlapping. Um, but the prep that I would want you to do um, for the MMA is much more about exploring that personal statement it's about being able to synthesize some of those insights into yourself so that when you're posed with a scenario, you know how to respond to that. I hope that helps. Um, okay, so what's the percentage of people that do get the offer out of how many got invited to the MMA? It's a very good question. I'm just going to look at my stats, which I did pull up earlier. Um, so that I've got the stats here. Um, so last year, and obviously this year is a new year and we have yet to have any events. Our first one is on the 8th of February. Um, we gave out approximately 
for those that were invited, somewhere between 10% of applicants that made it to an MMA um, got an offer at the MMA stage. So we are looking at applicants that are exceptional and are going to be at the high end of performance. So roughly how long will the typed responses be for the MMA question? So it depends on the compilation of the task, but the whole task is only seven minutes and there's often um, a breakdown of anywhere between three and seven questions or parts to a task. So um, that gives you an idea of the expectation of the amount um, of, of writing. Okay. So do we need to build up our academics too in order to ace both the MMAs and MMIs? Uh, no, we're not asking you any academic insights in the MMA and MMIs. It is all about how you respond to scenarios as, a, as an individual and as a human being. Sorry, there was a sneeze. I knew it was going to creep up on me. Um, so uh, next question, if I do the MMA on the 8th of February, will it be possible to receive a response within the month of February? So we have a four week turnaround um, for results. Um, so when you've sat the MMA within four weeks, you will receive the outcome. So I can't guarantee that it's going to be um, in February. That's not right, is it? Yeah, I can't guarantee it's going to be in February, um, but it will be. Uh, within four weeks of the event. Do you have data calculations in the MMA? Uh, sometimes, sometimes we have data and data interpretation or numeracy steps. And if you're allowed to use a calculator, um, it will say on the instruction in that station. So have one by you, um, but if you're allowed to use it or not, will be explicit on the day. So how many questions are there in the MMA? So in the MMA, there are five tasks, and within those tasks, they can be split down further, and they vary in terms of their construction because they vary in what they're testing. So that's as explicit as I can be at this point. So is there a set time limit per question or for the MMA as a whole? We have five tasks. Each of those are seven minutes long. You have one minute reading time for each task and then the transfer time between. So we tend to ask candidates to block out two hours to account for the registration, um, the briefing, um, the event themselves, and the debriefing. So if you're not a math student, does that affect your MMA? Uh, no. Um, the Any data interpretation and numeracy is set at a very low level that we would expect you um, as a academically bright individual um, to be able to cope with. It's not a a-level math um, data, it is a interpretation and a looking at information. So not having maths will not affect your ability to pass the MMA. Um, okay, some of these are um, repeating, so I'm just going to jump over a couple of them. Um, how does the University of Buckingham prepare students for the USMLE and residency? It's a really interesting question. Um, because the focus of our course is to um, is to teach people and prepare people to access the foundation course um, in the UK. Um, and so we don't specifically prepare students for the USMLE in residency, but we do have a lot of students um, that choose to go back or into the United States environment or North American environment. And therefore, what we found is that actually the, the step one of USMLE is best to take at the end of phase one, which is when you transfer on the Buckingham course um, to at the end of phase one, you move from campus into a clinical based environment. And at that stage, you are probably your, your highest level of preparation in order to take step one. There's usually a community um, of students that form a society or a an external extracurricular group that do the support steps. And we as a faculty can provide you with the paperwork and sign-offs that you need to make those prep those applications. But we don't specifically have any um, stream preparing you for the USMLE. We do, however, build into our course the opportunity for observerships and um, four-week um, 
elective style placements in the US. Um, they are in potentially the end of year two, um, the student selected components in year three and the student selected components in year four. Um, and that is student driven, but the opportunities and the time frames are there for you to take those opportunities to do those observ observerships and electives. So I hope that helps. Okay, um, there's some more questions about how many questions are in the MMA, how many sentences. There's no right answer to that. So we want you to answer it in the way that you think is appropriate, because that's part of assessing whether you've got the right um, feel and the right response to these things. Remembering that you've got seven minutes for the whole thing, so therefore you need to plan your time appropriately. So I'm just going to jump over those specific questions. So, um, Haydar, thank you for your questions around are there any sample tasks for the MMA um, for guidance purposes? No, there's not. And that's a theme in our course, actually, that we don't provide any past papers um, for our assessments either. Because actually, each time there's a different question, it's completely taken in a new context. So, we don't want you to prep your answers for these tasks. We just want you to be natural and a response that you would give as a normal human being. So no, there's no past papers. Um, there's no guidance questions. Um, will there be personalized questions based on, okay, so will there be questions based on work experience and personal statements? No, we don't ask you personalized questions based on your work experience or personal statements. But what we say is those experiences will allow you to put context into some of the t the tasks and will allow you to contextualize your responses to when we're discussing things like motivation. So we don't specifically ask about them, but there is an opportunity for you to draw on those experiences, I would say, in some of the tasks that we ask you to do. So they have value, but not in the explicit way that you're asking. Okay. I'm just going to scroll down a little bit on my screen. OK, so what makes the course four and a half years compared to other medical schools? It's a really good question. Um, so why are we different to everybody else? And there's a couple of different things to pick up on here. So we call ourselves an accelerated course because we're four and a half rather than the five or six year courses at other places in the UK. And we do that by essentially not having long summer holidays. And that's important because it means that you don't have a large break to forget things um, and lose your skills and competencies. But it also means you don't have a large break to go back um, to your home country if you're an international student or have a job and solidify your income. So thinking about that lack of, of long summer holiday is important when you're thinking about whether Buckingham is right for you. So take out the long summer holidays, essentially. Um, how many questions? No, I've answered that already. I'm not going to go back over that. In the MMA, um, the, is it true that the interviewee doesn't communicate with the interviewer? It is true. You have an invigilator that guides you through your forms-based process in which you type and select your answers. So there is an ability to communicate with the invigilator, but you don't have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I think I've covered most of those, those questions. I'm just going down. Hi, Hannah. I love it when I get a hello, my name is Hannah. Um, hi. Um, is there any way we can get more clarification? I know there will be different structures, but we should expect scenarios or mathematical questions or more getting to know us. Um, I see Sasha is typing an answer. So I'm sorry, Sasha, but I'm going to talk about this um, as well. So... Clarification wise, there will be opportunities for you in the MMA to think about interpreting or critiquing things, and that could fall under lots of different banners. There may be um, media for you to look at. There might be um, scenarios for you to look at. So other than that, there's really very little that I can give you on top of what I've already said. Okay. So. Yeah, I don't want to prepare you. I would love to see the real Hannah at the MMA. 
Is there any method of practice we can prepare? So the things that I've talked about, think about yourself, have some self-reflective moments. Think about why you want to be a doctor, your motivations, your why you want this school, um, what it is about healthcare that drives you, what values are important to you. Do the healthcare values of the NHS align with your values? And it's okay if they don't, because not everybody you know, believes that the NHS is working well at the moment. So actually having some discourse is really important. But understanding the why is really, really at the top of my agenda. And you know, part of the selection process that we um, participate in. Um, what have we got? You mentioned that exceptional participants may be offered admission only on the MMA. Could you talk about what makes a more exceptional MMA participant? So being able to approach these tasks in a holistic way, in the ways that I've described, um, the values and attributes that align with the values and attributes of us as a medical school and in good medical practice. Um, and essentially getting high scores on the stations because of all those things aligning. So it's the highest scoring candidates, the highest performers that might get an offer. And that's by understanding good medical practice, understanding yourself and where you fit into the healthcare profession. So all the things that I've said, have a think about, do that, and you stand a really good chance um, of getting an offer outright in an MMA. But I will say the majority of people that go on to do an MMI, um, they're very successful as well. So it's not a bad thing um, to do an MMI. Um, it just means um, that, that we just want to check. We want to check more things. We want to talk to you as an individual. Okay. How big is one cohort for medicine? And that's a really interesting question. So we have... Um, up to 230 students in one cohort, um, and that's across our two campuses um, this year at Buckingham and Crewe, and that includes anybody that is repeating or deferring. So we're looking roughly around 200 new applicants getting a place in our medicine cohort for Med 25, which is the year that you're applying for. Okay. Last year, we had around 2,500 applications. So you can think about the ratio of places to applications um, and the likely elements of success, therefore. Okay. So somebody asked if the MMA scenarios are like the situational judgment section of the UCAT. And that's a really good question. And I would say some of the things that you might come across might be like a situational judgment. Um, scenario. Um, but it is not entirely like a UCAT. So we don't use the UCAT system. Um, so there is no requirement to have a UCAT score to uh, enter the University of Buckingham Medical School. And therefore, we choose to have a different process by which we look at our candidates. So some of it may be similar, but it is not exactly like UCAT now. So there's a question about whether the MMI thinks about the desired attributes for a doctor. Absolutely. Both the MMA and the MMI are mapped to good medical practice. And that means we're testing things that good medical practice indicates are important for you being a doctor. We don't necessarily want you to be perfect at all of those things because those um, gu uh, guidance is about qualified doctors. But we want to see things in you that illustrate that we can enhance, that you have the seeds of those attributes already that we can help nurture and grow. So how many of those who got an MMA, who got an MMA, how many then got an MMI and then went on to get a place? Um, so let me just have a look. Um, so I would say of those that MMA, MMI, um, we're looking at around 60% of those that go on to do an MMI get offered a place. So it's it's a process that deflex rather than flex, I would say.
Um, I'm going down my questions. I think I've answered quite a lot of these. Um, me down. Could I elaborate further on preparing students um, to attend the foundation in the UK? Absolutely. Um, so our course is four and a half year undergraduate course, which means that when you graduate, um, you will sit a national exam that allows you to get a, a provisional license to practice and provisional registration with the GMC. In the UK, you then have a two year foundation course, which gives you your um, full license to practice. And that foundation course at the moment, and things may change by the time you guys graduate, um, has a four lots of six month placement, which allows you to experience a range of different specialties. And once you've completed those two years, you can then apply for core specialty training. So what we're creating in our four and a half year course is a graduate that can function across all of the different specialties. So you can go to primary care, you can go to emergency medicine, you can go to cardiology and be a successful junior doctor in those um, elements. Get experience and decide then in those two years of foundation what specialty training you would like. It's very similar to a residency program um, in the US. Hopefully that helps um, and clarifies that question. But do ask more if you have more questions. So there's a question about the maths. I think I've scared people about the maths. Please don't be scared. It is more data interpretation. You don't need any knowledge of calculations. Um, <laughs> somebody's asked about you know, being stuck in a coffin. Please don't panic. <laughs> um, it is basically, can you interpret information in front of you that might be in a written or numeric form? Okay. Um, I'm going down and there's lots of repeating questions. So I would urge you to have a look at the, the webinar and the questions I've already said. Um, clarifying question about the accelerated. So four and a half years, we're taught, teaching exactly the same things that's taught by other UK medical schools that follow a five year curriculum. Absolutely, we are. We're all meeting the outcomes for graduates by the GMC. We're just choosing to do that in a way that has less holiday, which reflects what you're gonna be doing when you graduate. So um, that's a, an important clarification. So thank you for that follow-up. What's the teaching style in the University of Buckingham Medical School? Again, really good question, relates to my day job. Um, so the teaching style is what we call guided learning. We have small group teaching environments in which we explore what may have been introduced to you either in self-directed learning where we've got recorded lectures or live lectures that happen just before the group work sessions. So we, it's not PBL and it's not case-based. It's what we think is the mixed, best mixture of both, in which our clinical educators who are near peer foundation doctors, um, so they've done their two years I was just talking about, guide you through learning about a topic that was introduced to you by a subject matter expert. So hopefully that gives you an insight into how deep to dive into a subject, what aspects you need to explore in a clinical context, but also in that small group, gives you the opportunity to collaborate with team members like you would in a clinical environment. So um, it's a blend of different um, teaching methodologies in what we call a guided learning scenario. Okay, how long are the holidays? So our standard um, structure for our term is 11 weeks of teaching, one week of revision, one week scheduled for assessment and one week of holiday that repeats three times and that's our three terms in a year. There's then an extended uh, assessment period at the end of the year in which um, our main big exams happen and then at the, um, if you're not successful at the first sit, there is an, a repeat sit opportunity before the new year starts. So there is a longer holiday towards the end of the year if you're very successful on the course. Um, but even if you need a repeat opportunity, it is all within one academic year. So I'm very aware um, that we are reaching the hour mark. And I know there are some questions that, that, hasn't, that haven't picked up on in the chat yet. I can see loads coming through. Um, so what we're going to do is to make sure that all of those questions have been answered. 
um, our marketing team will download them all for me and we'll have a review of those questions and make sure that we've provided answers either in the recording or on a separate um, piece of information that will be available to anybody that's registered for this webinar. So at this point, what I want to do is just say thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your questions. Um, our admissions team are available um, on the email that I know you all have um, to answer any questions that you might have over and above anything we've covered here. They're always there, always willing to answer questions They're on this call as well. Um, thank you for putting the link there um, in the chat. Um, so thank you for attending. Listen back to me, and I'm really sorry if I sound clunky at any point, um, but this recording will be a valuable resource for you to ensure that you are prepared for the selection events at the University of Buckingham Medical School. Hopefully, I will see you all in person when you start registering for Med25. Thank you very much, and this is the end of the webinar.